Good morning, and welcome to Resurrection Sunday. Amen. As we celebrate and worship the risen King, let's take a look at the screen at one of my favorite verses. And that's not it. <laughs> that is not it. But let's go to the next slide. One of my favorite times of the year is to be able to say these three words and to have you respond in kind. Church, he is risen. He is risen indeed. I say it again, he is risen. He is, he is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Let us stand and celebrate and worship. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the praises of our King rise among us. Let it rise. Let the songs of the Lord rise among us. Let the songs of the Lord rise among us. Let the joy of the King rise among us. Let it rise. Oh, let it rise. Oh. Glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the joys of the King rise among us. Let it rise. Let the songs of the Lord rise among us. Let the songs of the Lord Rise among us, let the joy of the King rise among us, let it rise. Oh, let it rise. Oh. songs of the Lord rise among us. Let the songs of the Lord rise among us. Let the joys of the King rise among us. Let it rise. Oh, let it rise. Oh, let it rise. Please be seated Praise just a moment. Thank you. It's Friday. Jesus is praying. Peter is asleep. Judas is betrayed. 
but Sunday is coming. It's Friday. Pilate's struggling. The council is conspiring. The crowd is vilified. They don't even know that Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The disciples are running like sheep without a shepherd. Mary's crying. Peter is denied. But they don't know that Sundays are coming. It's Friday. The Romans beat my Jesus. They robe him in scar. They crown him with thorns. But they don't know that Sundays come. It's Friday. See Jesus walking to Calvary. His blood dripping. His body stumbling. And his spirits burdened. But you see, it's only Friday. Sunday's come. It's right. The world's win. People are sinning. And evil's grim. It's right. The soldiers nail my Savior's hands to the cross. They nail my Savior's feet to the cross. And then they raise him up next to criminals. It's fine. But let me tell you something. Sunday's come. It's fine. The disciples are questioning what has happened to their king. And the Pharisees are celebrating that their scheming has been achieved. But they don't know. It's only Friday. Sunday's come. It's Friday. He's hanging on the cross, feeling forsaken by his father, left alone and down. Can nobody save him? Oh, it's Friday, but Sunday's come. It's Friday, the earth trembles, the sky grows dark, my king yields his spirit. It's Friday, hope is lost, death has won, sin has come, and Satan's just a laugh. It's Friday, Jesus is buried, a soldier stands guard, and a rock is rolled into place. But it's Friday. It is only Friday. Sunday is a coming. And guess what, church? Amen. It is Sunday. Amen. He is risen. He is risen yes. indeed. Let's Thank stand you. and sing and celebrate about that wonderful resurrection Sunday morning. See what a morning. See what a morning. Glorious be bright with the dawning of hope in Jerusalem. In the grave close to them with light as the angels announce Christ is risen. See the salvation that brought in love, born in pain, paid in sacrifice. Fulfilled in Christ the man, for he lives, Christ is risen. In sorrow she turns from the empty tomb Hears a voice speaking, calling her name It's the Master, the Lord, raised to life again 
Turn with me in your Bibles to Isaiah 53. We're going to be looking at 3 through 12, and this is a messianic prophecy. He was despised and rejected by man, as a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that is before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had, not, he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The, Lord, the will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. I'm going to read from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 through 21. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trans trespasses to them, and has committed us to a word of reconciliation. 
Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And that might be the most important verse we hear and we sing today. He became sin who knew no sin that we might become his righteousness. I love scripture because it always, always comes true. We sing about Jesus Messiah who was born God Emmanuel, God with us. He's dead, crucified, and raised to life on the third day. He is our Jesus Messiah. Stand and sing with us.
He's Jesus Messiah. The name above all names. Blessed Redeemer. Emmanuel. The rescue. The ransom from heaven, Jesus the Messiah, the Lord of all. He's Jesus the Messiah. But you can clap to Jesus Messiah, Amen. the one, the only, the risen Amen. Lord. If you Amen. ever walk into church thinking you can't Hallelujah. clap, you find a different church. Because we will praise Amen. his name, the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords, for he is risen. Amen. Thank you. Please Thank be seated. You, Jesus. A good morning, Crossroads. Happy Easter to you. Kids, you guys are dismissed to Children's Church. Andrew and Rachel are in the back, ready for you guys. We are going to continue our celebration in praise and worship, in God's word, in prayer, as we dig into the resurrected Christ and celebrating the goodness and the love and the mercy that God has given us through him this morning. I want you to turn to Luke chapter 19. I want to start there, celebrating the resurrection of Christ, celebrating the holiness of God, and celebrating the faithfulness of his word. Luke chapter 19, and I want to read just a small section from verse 38 to 42. Luke chapter 19, 38 to 42. It's where we left off last week. When he's coming to Jerusalem, being praised, and says, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answers and says to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. And as he drew near, he saw the city and he wept over it, saying, If you had known, even you, Jerusalem, his people, the Jews, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they're hidden from your eyes. The cost of peace Jesus praised by hundreds of thousands of people and yet still weeping over the city because that sin would soon cause his death on the cross, calling it our day, the day we needed for salvation, not him. And in thinking of this, I can't help but take a many time out and wonder or maybe let this thought sink into our brains this morning. If there's no sorrow, if there's no death, if there's no sadness in heaven, then it's no wonder Jesus wept so often on earth. Especially as he's coming into one of his greatest celebrations of being the Lord on the history of the planet. And yet he spends it weeping for those who don't know who he actually is and the cost of sin and what holiness requires. A perfect sacrifice, sinless blood for permanent payment. The expression we might have in a humanistic sense is emotions run wild. 
Well, definitely not wild for him, but deep and genuine. Salvation's hidden from their eyes, but you need to understand this morning it's not hidden from ours. You're given the Bible, the Word of God, completed so that you might know who you are and who He is and how salvation happens. Then you're given the Holy Spirit so that you could even have faith and return the love that He's given to you and you could respond in the faith that He's given in measure according to what's given to you. You have Jesus, now resurrected, seated at the right hand of the Father in all authority, making intercessions for us so that we might surrender our person, our pride, our mind, and our eternity back to its creator. That's what Jesus is praying for you on a daily basis that you might return to him in the relationship that he set up from the beginning. Jesus, the man who knew everything and everyone, who saw everything, who heard everything, felt everything, redeemed everything, the man that is God, doing this on your behalf, finished our race from sin and death. And hundreds of years before his death, burial, and resurrection, he speaks through the prophet Hosea, to us so that we might know he is the Messiah and to the point of absolutely every day that has ever been lived. In chapter 6, verses 1 through 3, it says, Come, and let us return to the Lord, for he has torn, but he will heal us. He is stricken, but he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. And on the third day, he will raise us up that we may live in his sight. Let us know. Let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. His going forth is established as the morning, and he will come to us like the rain, like the latter and the former rain to the earth. Raised up on the third day so that you might live in his sight. That's present tense. That's not future. That's not just, I'm hoping for a resurrection or a rapture or eternity with him. That's life now, active, living, engaged, in love, following, obedient, repentive, in praise and worship to the glory of God because of who Jesus is. Let's pray together and let's dig into how we got here. Father, thank you. First for the day, because it's yours. And it's good because you made it. And it's good because we get to speak your word publicly, proclaiming your goodness and your grace and your love and your mercy. But also your holiness, our own sin, and the cost that that war creates. Father, we thank you that you revive us. We thank you that on the third day you raised up Jesus so that we can live in your sight so that sinful can become redeemed and righteous and holy so that we can have an eternity back with the Father that created us. We praise you for those things. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to turn to the book of Hosea again. If you're not there, go ahead and turn there. I want to go to chapter 13 and just read two of these verses. Chapter 13 in the book of Hosea, a prophet in one of Israel's worst times as we've continued on dealing with the sinful nature of man and the goodness and the patience and the long-suffering, but also the holy requirements of God. There's a couple of verses in chapter 13, which is right near the very end of what Hosea is saying to us or God is saying to us through him. In verse 4, it says, Yet I am the Lord your God ever since the land of Egypt, and you shall know no God but me, for there is no Savior besides me. That's a bit of peace, that we don't have gods that are competing for our affection so that we might have to decide how much of my day, my time, or my energy goes into Jesus alone. It's 100%, church. 
There's no other name by which men must be saved. There's no other Savior except God. There's no other salvation coming except what can be found in Jesus. And because of that, in this section of Scripture, God is saying, of all the things that you've forgotten about me and drug yourself through, be reminded, I am, and I've always been with you, no matter what you've put me through. And I'm never leaving. I'm going to be your salvation because there's no other God but me and no other Savior besides me. In verse 14, he says, I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. O death, I will be your plagues. O grave, I will be your destruction. Pity is hidden from my eyes. I absolutely love that. If you don't understand what's being said there, it's saying sin and death is weak. And Jesus is going to take no mercy on sin and death, but he's already given it to you. Pity will be hidden from his eyes when he comes back and stands on the earth. The promise to hold nothing back when he brings salvation to his people. That's what he's saying near the end of the prophecy given through Hosea. Sin, Satan, and death won't be safe from the power of God. No shelter, no pity, no quarter, no terms, no bargaining, no surrender offered. He's coming. And when he does, he's going to be riding a white horse, and it's going to be war, and the sword of his word is going to come out of his mouth, and it's going to deal with sin instantly in that setting, and heaven's coming with him. Right? And when he says no pity will be given, that means all of sin will be dealt with. There'll be no excuse. There will only be salvation in his name or judgment without. Because he is coming, church. Get ready. Sin and death is what he's saying in verse 14. Because Jesus is coming. The power of the grave is death, and the power of death is sin, but the Lord buys us back. Imagine that, if you will, as Hosea did when God told him to go get his wife, who had gotten herself sold back into slavery for the pleasure of men. And he goes to some other guy and says, that's my wife. Just like God goes to Israel, and he goes to you this morning and says, that's mine. Sin and death, you cannot have it. And sin and death says, really? Just like the man who now owned Gomer, Hosea's wife. And he says, well, I've purchased her. She's mine. He says, no, she's my wife. You can't purchase her. That can't happen. He says, well, it's already happened, and now she's my toy, which is the same way Satan looks at you. And I'm going to play with that toy and do whatever I want to with that toy until I get what I want from that toy and you can't do anything about it. And God says, that's okay. I'll buy your back. Which is exactly what Hosea did when he found his wife. He bought her back. A payment that shouldn't have been made, a cost that had already been paid for, and a woman that was already his. Very much like you are this morning. A creation that is already his, a salvation that's already been paid for, and still a toy to sin if you're not careful. If you don't follow after Christ, if you believe there's salvation coming in any other name or think for a second that death in the grave is not yours if it is not for the name of Jesus, because it is. So the man tells him, pay more and you can have back what's yours. Jesus does the same thing, and just like Gomer, we're ransomed. That's payment. We're purchased back from our captor, from our sin, back for God, even though we're already his, because we had a debt just like Gomer that we could not pay. There was no amount of playing as somebody else's toy that was going to set her free. It was too late. The same happens with us in sin. One sin is too much. And because Adam didn't run his race well and didn't lead well, we're born into it, and then we make it worse by every sinful choice along the way. And it's a debt we couldn't possibly pay, which is why the cross is so important. It's why God's love and mercy is so important. It's why grace has to happen. It's what 
Easter is all about celebrating the death, burial, and resurrection of the only Savior that's ever coming. God hates death so much, so much more than we possibly ever could because he remembers the day standing Adam and Eve in the garden and watching them make the choice for sin and death. It's not a surprise to him. And he remembers that day. And he hates death and he hates sin and he hates sorrow more than you ever possibly could. But in verse 14 in the book of Hosea, he says, Oh, death, I will be your plagues. Oh, grave, I will be your destruction. Pity is hidden from my eyes. And why? Because the power of the grave is useless against the Lord. He says, I'm going to ransom them from the power of the grave, and I will redeem them from death. I want to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and read a portion of this in the New Testament past Jesus' resurrection so that you can hear exactly what he says. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, when this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? And O hell, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing? Could you even imagine... The strength of death being sin and the strength of sin being the law, meaning the knowledge that God gave you at creation when you belong to him, that there's not a person on the planet, no matter what social structure or country you live in, that doesn't know wrong is wrong. They just don't know the name for why it's wrong. And because of that, the strength of sin is the law. We do what we want instead of what we should, and the strength of sin grows because we knew better even when we pretend we don't. God's creation gives us no excuse for not glorifying God the Father in the first place. So when we take all of our affections and we become toys to sin and death, we are without excuse because that's the power of sin, the knowledge of good and evil, which happened way back in the garden, but thanks be to God who gives us victory because of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. You are now standing on the side that will be returning with Jesus when he stands on the earth and gives no quarter in judgment for sin and death. You've already won. If you belong to Jesus, you've already won. And if you don't, you can belong to Jesus. Death and sin are powerless, and they cannot steal you from Jesus because he is the Christ, meaning he is the one chosen to be sent, to live perfect, to die sinless, making a blood payment for you that you cannot make on your own because your payment has to be eternal, just like his is eternal, except you never measure up, and he already has. It's already finished if you believe in his death burial and resurrection and I want to flip to the book of Matthew and tell you exactly why go to Matthew chapter 28 this is our celebration this morning and there's so much good and so much funny about what is happening in this section even though it's meant to be a sobering reminder it is absolutely awesome Matthew 28 starting in verse 1 and reading down to 10 now after the Sabbath As the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. I'm going to take just a small time out there. Guys, don't let your ladies come to see the tomb without you. If Adam had done what he was supposed to in the garden, we wouldn't be in this mess. That instruction was given to Adam, which was then given to Eve. Don't let your ladies be the one running to that tomb without you. They go to the tomb. The other Mary came to see the tomb. In verse 2 of chapter 28 in the book of Matthew, it says, And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven. Could you even imagine a massive earthquake in a graveyard where you just went to see the death and burial of what you think is the Messiah, but now he's dead, and an earthquake happens, and an angel descends and appears before you. What? I would lose it. 
Absolutely loosed. And in fact, some of them there did. Let me read this to you. The angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. Oh, that is so good. There's no cathedrals here. There's no pipe organ and gold chandeliers. There's an angel of God who just shook the earth at his arrival because God gave him a piece of his glory. And he rolls back the stone which Jesus is already missing from. And he sits on the door. It would be like somebody my size pushing a semi into a parking lot because it ran out of gas and then hopping on the hood and be like, what are you doing here? That's the picture I get in my brain when I think about this. Casual, comforting, odd. Because there's not a multitude of angels singing right now. It's just one angel sent to do a little bit of light work because Jesus is already raised from the dead. And then he plops himself down on top of the stone that they thought was going to hold his body in place just to make sure we understood he could do it. And then he sat on that thing. His countenance was like lightning. You understand that means all of his showing skin looked like an electrical nightmare, right? Like lightning. And his clothes were as white as linen. Of course they are because they're reflecting the glory of God as he gives some of that power in presence because God sent him to do the works. Do you understand you hold the same position, church? That you're meant to reflect some of the glory of God because you're given his power in his presence in this place now? So you just go ahead and do the work. You talk about Jesus, you serve other people, you live sacrificially, and then you hop right up on the hood and say, what are you doing here? Because that's the God you serve. That's the resurrection that we're counting on because God's word says it's true and everything past has already been made true. So why wouldn't this be? Let me continue in this section. In verse 4 it says, And the, and the cards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the women, Don't be afraid. For I know that you seek Jesus who is crucified. He's not here, for he's risen. As he said, come and see the place where the Lord lay. Do you imagine that? You ever seen a kid sit on a chair that's too big for him and they just dangle their legs? An earthquake brings a message to earth in the form of an electric nightmare dressed in white. And the guards are so afraid, they pancake out. They might as well be dead. And in that reaction, the angel tells the ladies that are there to see Jesus, don't be afraid. You're here to see Jesus, aren't you? He's not here, he's risen. Just like he said he was. Why are you looking for him in a dirt hole or a rock tomb? He's already gone. He told you he would be gone. Go ahead and take a look. And then just casually dangle your legs off the stone and wait to see what happens. (laughs) I absolutely love thinking about this section. He's not here. He's risen. As he said, come and see the place where the Lord lay. Verse 7. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he's risen from the dead and indeed he's going before you into Galilee where you will see him. Behold, I have told you. Means take a look. See that it's real. I've told you the message that I'm supposed to give you. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples' word. Does that describe your life in Christ, church? Because we're here saying Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. But does that make you want to run and go share the good news, both with other believers and for those that don't know? If you don't have the same energy and excitement, maybe you should picture seeing this in your brain every time you get nervous about spreading the word because everyone else around needs to hear it. They went to tell his disciples, and behold, Jesus met them, saying, Rejoice! Okay, it's me. Surprise! Just like I told you it was going to be me. That baby doesn't have to leave. That's not bothering me at all. (laughs) I absolutely love it. 
surprise, here I am, rejoice. So they came and they held, his, held him by his feet and they worshiped him. And Jesus said to him, don't be afraid. Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee and there they will see me. And here's the reason why it is so cool because verse 18 in the exact same chapter says, Jesus came and spoke to them just like he promised he would. And what he said was, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. All of it. There's no other authority coming. There's no other need to look for anything else. That is everything. So I'm going to go read to you from the book of Job, chapter 19, verse 28. Oh, no, I'm going to read before that. I'm going to read verse 25 and 27. The book of Job, 19, 25 through 27. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at the last on the earth, And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes behold it, and not another, how my heart yearns within me. Job knows full well that in the end, Jesus is going to stand on the earth because he's been given all authority, and there's no other name by which man must be saved, either in heaven or on earth. He is everything. And he says, listen, even if I die, I know full well that in my flesh, I'm going to be resurrected and I'm going to see Jesus standing on the earth. My God is going to do the impossible over and over again. And my heart yearns for it. But then right after that, he gives a pretty interesting close or warning that I want you to hear because it's important. After he says, I'll see him for myself and not through somebody else's eyes because God's going to restore my body and God's going to be standing on the earth. He says, if you should say, how shall we persecute him since the root of the matter is found in me? Is that not what happened to get Jesus to the point of the cross anyway? Listen, it's better for one man to die for all of this than for all of us to have to suffer through it. Even though the root of the matter, sin, is found in me. How shall we persecute him then? Because I don't like the fact that sin is my fault. I don't like the fact that I would have to pay for something my fault. And so even in the book of Job, it talks about ditching sin and putting the blame on someone else. Here's what he says. Be afraid of the sword for yourselves. For wrath brings punishment of the sword. That you may know there is a judgment. He says, listen, I know full well my Redeemer lives, and at the end, I'm going to see him standing on the earth, and I'm going to stand right there with him. But if you think for a second that your sin makes you uncomfortable and somebody else is going to take your place, he has, but just because you've persecuted him doesn't mean judgment isn't coming for you unless you put your faith and trust in him. So if you think for a second that because sin is making you uncomfortable or the word is making you uncomfortable or God is making you uncomfortable or other people that are speaking about it are making you uncomfortable, then choose which one you would rather, which is the end of what Job is saying. Would you rather stand on the earth with your Redeemer or would you rather him come to you with a sword of judgment because he is coming? Make no mistake. And when he comes back, he's not just going to have one guy sitting on a stone, kicking his legs, looking like lightning, saying, what are you looking for? He's going to come back with thousands and say, you've missed it. I'm already here. I'm already here, and I'm the only one coming. There is no other Savior besides me. God gives us an example of the gospel all throughout Scripture from the beginning to the end, and I want you to hear it this morning. In the beginning, he creates the heavens and the earth, and he says over and over again, it's good, but that good creates something. The goodness and the glory of God causes both angels and people to want to be God, not just like him, but to want to be the one in charge. And God's design, love is a choice followed by an action, and he gave us free will, the ability to choose whether or not to love him back. And in that choice, we chose not to. We chose to love ourselves more than we love God. And so did a third of the created angels. War breaks out in heaven. Sin and death makes its way to earth. God creates hell as a punishment for angels, not for us, reestablishing our need to choose love. But instead, we choose a knowledge that causes sin and death. 
And since we can't bring sin and death to heaven, or else heaven would be a lie, we can't go there. We can't be with God in heaven. When we still have sin, sin separates us from the holiness, and the heavens are saved from sin by God. But God designed us to be with him. And the only payment that destroys sin, making full payment, permanent, eternal payment, is the sacrificial death of someone holy without sin. This is why Jesus was born. Jesus himself, God in person, payment for our sin, died on the cross to set us free. When he did that, that permanent paying, that permanent payment is completed in your action of faith, responding to the faith that he gives you that your confession and your belief in Jesus as a sinless sacrifice is what sets you free. If you confess with your mouth that the Lord is Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. This is Romans chapter 10, 9. Here is all of Christianity in one sentence. It's Romans six twenty three. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So I want to go back to Hosea and read you two verses and end exactly where we started. Hosea chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Come, it's an open invitation. Anyone willing, anyone who's heard the truth, anyone who knows they're sinful, anyone who knows they need Jesus, come and let us return to the Lord. For he has torn, but he will heal us. He has stricken, but he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. And on the third day, he will raise us up that we may live in his sight. So come and let us know. Let me pray. Father, thank you again for this morning and for your word. And thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his death because it paid for my sin. Thank you for his burial as scripture comes true through prophecy and I can read it for thousands of years. And thank you for his resurrection because that means that my sin is paid for, the payment has cleared, and I can be resurrected to new life just like Job said. So at the end, when Jesus stands on the earth, I can stand face to face and I will know him and he knows me. We praise you for that gift. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <clears throat> and what's next? Our risen Savior ascended to heaven and was seated at the right hand of God where he became our King of kings and Lord of lords. Let us stand and sing together. Despise, oh, for we 
even in your suffering, you saw to the other side. Knowing this was our salvation, Jesus, for our sin, you died. Because he is risen. He is risen indeed. Be safe, be blessed, and be a light to the world.